remember the last time that so many people were here. <laughs> uh, so today we are going to make an uh, introduction into contact improvisation from some historical and theoretical point of view. I would like to thank Romain Duget for sharing the material with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Zerkova and uh, the Slovenian Centers and Archives. I'm very honored and flattered that we can have this material here and that it also brings some additional people to look at this special place. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, um, for the beginning, I would suggest that we try to let's say outline which were the crucial conditions that brought to the, up to the invention of, of contact improvisation. I mean, with the, some kind of historical data, I know that from 69 to 71, Stu Paxton was part of the cast of Ivan Rainer's continuous project, Daughter Daily, which was a kind of very, very special, uh, special dance project, or some kind of new choreographic work, open work, that they uh, developed to this period. And in this, after this, let's say that the, after the finished process, I think in January 1972, Stu Paxton was teaching at Oberlin College, uh, at Oberlin College in Ohio, and he started to develop contempt, uh, contact improvisation with the 17 students, which is kind of, but I think there are, if we go a little bit back, there are a certain kind of, uh, there had to, there, there had to be some kind of special, special conditions provided in order for something like this, like, and this kind of improvisation, the special practice to happen. And I would, I would ask you if you, let's say, what, what is for you, what you would say that were kind of these crucial conditions? So mm -hmm. I, I put videos behind me. Uh, if your eyes get tired of layering my what I say and what you see, you can close them. Uh, in general, I invite you to not listen to me or to us <laughs> if you are tired Sure. Like many events or inventions, there are you know several historical trends mm -hmm. that you can retrace. The one that you mentioned I want to honor is this that I am watching. It's the closest event before contact improvisation. It's called Grand Union. It's a collective of 12 dancers, actually 12 choreographers, who set out to collectively improvise for five hours, sometimes two hours, sometimes five hours, without knowing what they were going to do. This is a very available thing now. Like this is something that is often practiced by dancers. This was extremely new in 72. Right? Improvisation on stage for dancers was practiced even in ballet but usually it was for the soloist, yes? Mm -hmm. It was not a collective adventure to do. Uh, not, not knowing in front of each other was not really practiced by dancers together. In the 70s was rising this movement of uh, letting go of the uh, you know, strong authorship of the choreographer or the maître de ballet over the dancer. There was a desire for um, 
let's say, somato-political explorations or experimentation. What would happen between us if we didn't know who is going to lead us to make things together? Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's a political experiment mm -hmm. in anarchism, in a way, in a very uh, original way of the word anarchism. We don't know who is going to lead. So they were presented as for the first time, 10 choreographers on stage. And indeed, that's what it was about. 10 authors that are dancing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A weird situation. Usually it's dancers that are dancing and choreographers that are out. Yes. So what you see here um, succeeding each other is different performances, different snippets of those performances, uh, where in those performances, Steve Paxton, was one of those 10 dancers, started to develop some kind of improvisation, of, of, of shared improvisation, in which he was in contact with another dancer. Yes, it was, it, it was still the same improvisation. We don't know what we're going to do, but he was in contact with another dancer. The dancer in question was the blonde one that just put his <laughs> shirt in his pants, uh, Douglas Durden, just, mm -hmm. just for you to Know. They, they were jumping at each other and enjoyed that little moment of jumping at each other and not knowing what they were doing. Uh, this was the origin, one of the origins of contact improvisation. What happened, so not if we improvise for five hours together with ten other people, but what happens if we don't know what we're going to do and we are put side by side? Mm. What happens? if we don't know what we're going to do, if we are in contact, yes? That was one of the origins, one of the key origins of contact improvisation. Just another, <laughs> I'm coming back. Another trend was actually represented by what was that? I wanted to begin with, which is <laughs> feet. Um, so I, I suppose you can guess what this is. These are feet, Florence Corin feet. Uh, she's a Belgian dancer and publisher. Uh, film from under, yeah? So what she's doing is just standing, yeah? What is fascinating in that situation, this is a film that was made by Steve Paxton, or with Steve Paxton. What is interested, interesting in that situation is the little movements, yes, that occur. Standing is not uh, stiff, relationship to the ground, it's a moving relationship to the ground. Very subtle, very small. That Steve, in 67, uh, for the first time, investigated as the small dance. The small dance of standing. Yeah? What is it? What is the situation? The situation is the dancers, uh, you can imagine, it, it was a class, he was teaching dancers. You can imagine the dancers being brought to the studio. It's six in the morning. It's six in the morning and the dancers are brought to the studio. And um, he gives them two things, a, a, a Kleenex and a, a piece of apple. Mm -hmm. They put it in front of them. And then they stand for an hour. They stand for an hour and he tells them a story or he tells them something. He tells them something that describes the event, the multifaceted events that are happening when you are standing. Right now you are sitting, but we can list some of them that are shared with the standing. There's the movement of your breathing, obviously, that is occurring. Just that could take an hour to try and figure out where is it happening? Is it happening in the upper long lungs, is it happening in your belly? Is your breath a bit short? There is the contact of your clothes on your skin. That's an event. Yes, it's a recurring event. We can't we tend to forget it. But that's an event. There's the weight of your eyes being suspended yes, in your orbit in your eye socket. And your eyes are constantly a little bit moving. There is the way 
shape of your buttocks if you were uh, standing. <laughs> this is the weight of your uh, on your feet. Yes, that is shifting a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. You can feel it, even if you don't do anything. You can feel it that something is happening. So that was a very central question for Steve Jackson. That was a very central mm -hmm. question since the beginning of the 1960s. So it, 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 it goes very far. The question was, what is ancient in movement? Kind of, what would be movement that is shared by every human being, or even, even further, every critter on Earth? What is the thing that we all have you know, in common before culture, and of course it is influenced afterwards by culture, by our ways of relating, or locally, our own ways of relating, but what would be, you know, what would be before that? And one response that he kept finding was the relationship to gravity. That, like, that, that is, you know, anything, anything you can think of has that relationship to gravity, um, and this is a structuring event. In the 1960s, Steve uh, started to, so I'm talking a lot about Steve, but contact improvisation is a much bigger movement, but we are in the pre, uh, the pre moment. Um, one thing that Steve investigated in the 1960s, he was in New York um, at that time, was uh, a series of performances of pedestrian movements. Uh, so pedestrian movement uh, is the movements that you do as you walk around the street, as you eat, as you smile to people, as you, yes, the movements that you do every day. Movements that we would not consider, or that weren't considered at that time, being part of the movements that you learn to do when you learn to dance. Yeah? You don't do dance, you don't do walking, you do pointe, yes? Or you do certain movements with your belly, you don't do simply sitting, yes? So his idea was to say, okay, let's, let's say, let's look at the possibility of looking at the performance of the pedestrian. How would that look like? To put, to ask people to actually do not the pointe, not the grand gesture that are visible, from a very long distance, that's why we do those extensions. What if we propose to them to perform something that they do every day, but they never consider as a performance, like walking? And of course, that you know, uh, prof uh, uh, generated a lot of issues. The main issue being that it's impossible to walk normally when someone is looking at you. Yes, like it's impossible to speak normally, like I'm, you know, I'm seeing that I don't speak very normally right now, uh, but that I construct my sentences in a certain way by the fact that I'm alone speaking and that you are all those ears focused on my you know, uh, saying. What happens when people look at you and you are asked to walk? Well, a lot of things happen, but there's a little stiffness that is created, yeah? You, you know that, you know, like, uh, uh, well, I'm going to perform it right now, a little bit exaggerated, but like kind of like a, um, uh, a certain shyness, yeah, a certain uh, a stiffness. That that was um, a, a curiosity. So he made a he made a piece called Satisfying Lover in '67, uh, right around the time where he did those uh, small dances where uh, 47 dancers would just cross the stage once, walking. Mm -hmm. And where you could have that you know, pleasure of observing the little uh, prestige reflexes, you know, those things that we do when we know that we are looked at, where you could observe those prestige reflexes that we have when we try, when we are being seen. That, that's something that he was, mm -hmm. you know, very curious. And of course, next to that, you could look at another thing, which is this gravity thing that we were talking about. You could look at the unique signature that every one of us has when they are, when
and we are performing work, simply walking. Yes? No, yeah, no one walks the same way. Because the weight is differently yes, put on parts of our body. And again, that was his interest. His interest was to manifest the uniqueness of our everyday movement, the signature behind everything that we do. So, why am I saying all this, and what does that have to do with contact improvisation? Uh, let's, uh, well, actually, you have images of contact improvisation behind you. Um, these are two performers dancing it, actually trying to do wrong of contact. <laughs> That's how they called it, uh, in 83. So it's wrong contact. Uh, it, it comes from a manifesto that they wrote together. It's Ishmael Richton Jones and Fred Holland. So they have a little manifesto saying, we, we, we are not going to touch each other. No, we are black. We are not going to touch each other. We will dance on music and we will wear street clothes. This is uh -huh. all wrong contact. Uh -huh. um, but as wrong contact, it's a very good example of contact improvisation. So what is the relationship between what you are seeing now in this screen and what I'm, going, what I'm about to put in front of your eye on this other screen, uh, which is um, simply people The sound, there is a I loudspeaker think, underneath them. I think sound, sound is not really necessary. Volume. Uh -huh. yeah. Is the volume up? Sorry for the bad quality of the video, but we have a small issue with the reader. Um, so, what is the relationship between what I was saying, the curiosity for anarchy, in the relationship between two people? and the curiosity of what is ancient in movement. Yes, that's the two things that I just mentioned as a possible origin. Well, you can <laughs> see for yourself. What is investigated here is something that uh, Steve and the other people that invented that form, oh, is it stopped? I guess it's stopped. Um, it's good, you can rest your eyes <laughs> from seeing information. Um, what was of interest was a neglected activity um, that dancers seem to have, to have forgotten at that time in modern dance and classical dance, which was simply to enter in contact with one mm -hmm. another. As much as in the 60s, the Steve and many of his colleagues of the pedestrian movement uh, school uh, discovered that walking, sitting, smiling, those simple gestures had been forgotten. In the 70s, Steve and the many colleagues that contributed to contact improvisation, such as Francis Jack Smith, Daniel Lefkoff, Lisa Nelson, and many others, what they discovered was simply that one simple activity was forgotten, was the meeting to touch. This was never shown on stage, only in specific moments of lift, which are almost not touching, you know, it's about flying more than and manipulating, then it's a very codified touch. So the question was, what happens? What happens if you put two people in contact with one another and they don't know how they are going to touch each other? The myriad of possibilities that open from that simple, very simple desire of investigation gave the title to the piece, a piece called Contact Improvisations, actually. It, had a, it, it was plural, the first occurrence of the piece, in 1972. Um, in 1972, what happened was that uh, Paxton, to whom I referred largely, who is kind of hidden in that pile of bodies over here, um, Paxton invited several uh, colleagues and students, 27, for a week of residency in a gallery in New York. It was an art gallery. There, were, there was not so much room uh, in it, like almost, uh, 
that size of the of, of, a, of a room, like very small. And actually, most people that were visiting the gallery were interested in the video that was after the what what the dancers were doing, which was a, a film by George Mantelli, where Steve was playing a drug addict, uh, licking frogs. Very strange movie. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and during that. Uh, show in 72, June 72, June 2 to 6, I think, mm -hmm. every day for five hours, they would come there and experiment. Really, like, the, the performance was not anything to do with something that had been rehearsed or even thought about, or it was just themselves trying to jump at each other, roll on each other, stand, as I showed, uh, just simply investigating live for the performance what they what the form could be. They didn't have any idea of you know founding a practice that is now practiced by thousands in the world. They were just doing a performance. They were just doing that one shot performance where they were jumping at each other trying to know what it means to enter a contact. Then something of a strange status happened. Something of a very rare uh, uh, development happened was that this performance that was just five days, four hours a day, this performance became a form. Mm -hmm. As if you could imagine there was a one, you know, one tango, one day there was a performance of tango and then suddenly thousands of people would be practicing tango, which is not how it happened. Like it, it emerged with many uh, you know, directions. With contact improvisation, it's a very weird event where one performance suffices to spread a practice everywhere. It says a lot about the power of uh, American hegemonism. Uh, and the way culture spreads and hybridizes uh, very quickly in our world, in our contemporary world. Obviously, that, I mean, that tells a lot about the possibilities of afforded by traveling, yes, afforded by uh, language dominance, the fact that we are speaking in English about this form, in Ljubljana, and French, and you know, all of those uh, um, doubtful issues. Uh, come into play to allow for contact improvisation to spread. But it's also a testament to something else, which we might talk about, which is the fact that they fell in love. Those first performers of contact improvisation in 1972 fell in love so much with what they experimented in a week that they said, I cannot not continue. It, this is, I, need, I need to do more of this. But they got separated. I'm telling the story like it's a, it's a tale. And so, <laughs> um, they got separated simply because they were, they, they, were, they were students in America. And as often, students in America, they, they concentrate in the college, but then they go back to families, yes? They go back to the various states of America. And so they got spread out. California, Seattle, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont. They got spread out, but they needed partners to practice. So what did, they, what did they do? They started to teach. They didn't know what they were teaching. They had no idea what they were teaching. But they still needed to start to teach it in order to be able to practice it, yes, to have just yeah. simply partners. Which is, in this room, there are a lot of people that practice contact improvisation and that teach it. They know what I'm referring to, because that's what happens to a lot of people. A lot of people encounter contact in a class, in a festival, by accident, and they come back home and they're like, I want to roll on people. <laughs> and no one kind of wants. So <laughs> you have to transmit the practice. Uh, and um, that's really that, uh, uh, the domino effect, or the, no, what, what is it called? Oh, the poker, the poker game effect, mm -hmm. yes? Like you, you like to play poker, you, can, you have to teach it, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this uh, effect in the film for Lasse Newton, obviously analyzes development of phases mm -hmm. of, of contact improvisation and he, he creates a certain kind of 
inabilities or awkwardness at the beginning, and obviously she knows in the in the later phases what's supposed to happen in order, obviously, for a contact to be, let's say, successful encounter at least to body. Uh, could you could you perhaps elaborate a little bit on what what were the <coughs> What were the, the problems at the beginning and how basically the contact through the 70s developed? Uh, um, one of the threads that I didn't mention and that you might have thought of is, is 72. So it's, we are post uh, the sexual revolution. Mm. We are post the hippie movement, as you can see in some images. So that's Steve Paxton and Nancy Stockton. You will see in some images, Steve really looks like Jesus, mm -hmm. the classical hippie, um, at least visually. Um, that's one of the things which might be surprising, that uh, Steve was really trying to counter, not to go with. He was trying to counter counterculture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a double negative. Meaning, uh, one of the things that happened with the counterculture was an opening of promiscuity and intimacy. Yes, it was an opening of the possibility for uh, um, queer and non-queer uh, sex to be open. So something was something was happening, but there was some somehow uh, also a reduction of possibilities, and this reduction would meant that touch was invested as a sexual event instead of all the myriad of other possibilities that touch contain. Yes? The intimacy of a sexual encounter or eroticism is important, of course it is. A part of who we are as living beings. Yes? But the array of gestures that are available is uh, uh, tremendous when you think of other possible touch. So that was one of the orientations that, uh, or the problems that, were f that, we, that they were facing, and one of the ways they resolved it, it evolved in mm -hmm. the years after, yes. but one of the ways they resolved it in the beginning was to say, this is about physics, not chemistry. Mm -hmm. This is about masses, not bodies, masses, yeah? So to seize, again, the, what is ancient in us, before we are sexu sexualized, and maybe the sexuation will happen in our relationship. You know, maybe the gender will happen in our relationship. But this is not the presupposition. The presupposition is not that we are a gendered or sexualized body that enters in contact. We are masses, yes? We weight a certain amount of weight. These masses rebound at certain qualities of uh, speed, of uh, uh, solidity or flexi flexibility. And these are the, uh, th this is the antidote to this uh, uh, moment of hyper-sexualization of touch that uh, was uh, prevalent in, in the still in the 1970s. So that, that was uh, one, one, mm -hmm. one big place. The other big place was, as you can see, there's a lot of disorientation. There's a lot of spins and obviously crazy, uh, crazy movements. So they have to uh, teach each other skills to survive. Yeah, simply, I mean, it's a, it's a fake survival because there's no you know, uh, literal threat to their lives, but at the same time, the situations they put themselves in threaten yeah, their uh, at least Well, well, wellness of the body. So they incorporated mainly through Steve in the beginning and then they, they brought many other tools. Uh, they incorporated various uh, tools from first the martial arts of Japan, mm -hmm. specifically Aikido, uh, that you might recognize in the gestures that you can see. One of them being this Aikido roll. 
which is uh, not the forward roll of Western gym gymnastics, but the lateral spirally roll of Aikido class. Um, somatic practices, or what was the emergence of somatic practices, was not named yet like that, but practices like release technique, even yoga, Alexander technique, all of those were incorporated in the toolbox of the dancer in order to what? In order to refine their sensitivity to themselves. One of the key things that Steve says, well, basically my life's work is about this, is what is my body doing when I am not conscious of it? What, what is it, you know, what were you doing before I asked you what, were, what your butt is doing on your chair right now? What was it doing? You don't, you don't know. Now, because you've turned your attention to it, it's fucked up because you are modifying the very events that you were, you know, turning your attention to. So, his idea was that every single tool that could allow for the consciousness to be grown should be put in service of the practice. And that led him to very strange and weird statements saying, well, you know, to if you do contact control system, then you have to study psychology, anthropology, biology, everything. Every single discipline that studies the human body, potentially, is your job to study if you pretend to practice contact control system. Why? Because when you do, when you improvise, everything that you presuppose is going to choreograph you. Yes? Everything that you, you haven't interrogated is one of the things that will dictate what you will do because you would not have asked what it is. So that led them to actually look at many disciplines at once. One of the main uh, disciplines, or one of the things that, were, that really touched deeply uh, uh, Steve and all of its part, of, I'm sorry, I'm focusing on Steve. I just made an exhibition on his work in and so I, I have that focus on Steve Patton. Please uh, redirect me and let me forget about him at some point. Uh, because, well, let's say, Steve only practiced contact improvisation for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Then he, he flew away <laughs> for 14 years. 14 years. Then he, he completely abandoned the practice, just went to a jam a year and started to develop other things, um, including a huge work in solo, a work in duet, whatever. So that's why I'm saying I should be shot. Mm. But still, in the 1970s, something impressed him very much that he brought to the pot of contact improvisation was a study by Daniel Stern. Daniel Stern is a, a child psychologist who studied infant and mother relationships. You know, the, um, he filmed, Daniel Stern, he filmed with a very slow motion camera, or fast motion camera, right? He, he filmed their interactions. And what he noticed was an ongoing dance between mother and infant that was invisible to the human eye. Uh, the, the beginning of a smile that is responded to the child, that is responded by the mother, that is responded by the child, that is responded by the mother, that finally grows into that wonderful, you know, cogent uh, movement of mother and infant. The language, the way uh, they sing together and adapt and attune to each other, he called that affective attunement, uh, Daniel Stern, the dance of an affective attunement. And Steve, when he saw that, when he saw those videos, you know, slowed down maximally, uh, when he saw that invisible dance, he said, that's what I want to practice. That's what I, that's, that's what I, I, I am interested in, yes? And that's actually what contact improvisation has afforded me to um, uh, elucidate. What are we doing? Again, what is my body doing when I'm not conscious of it? But what are our bodies doing when we are not conscious of it? And this is less, you know, what is my body doing? 
personal solipsistic investigation. But as soon as you put the we in the pot, as soon as you put the negotiations uh, that you are with the others, then suddenly a world opens. And that world of the affective attunement was very much the, the uh, focus of their investigation. So I'm mentioning all this, why? Well, because it's cool. And uh, because that explains why you have so many videos behind you. That story about the video camera filming the infant and mother, they, that influenced greatly uh, the whole bunch of contact improvisers who said, wait, but we can use the camera to film ourselves not knowing what we are going to do, which is basically what the mother and infant are doing when they are interacting. We can film ourselves and then review the films, mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> of our practice in order to try and put words in the practice, mm -hmm. yes? To try and, like, um, I don't know how to, <laughs> like, uh, widen the spectrum of time in order to fill as much as precision in description as we can to understand what the hell are we doing. Those videos exist for that, for that reason. They exist because after each performance of contact improvisation for the first five years, they spent as much time reviewing the film and talking mm -hmm. as a collective about what they had done as they had spent in the, in the performance mode. So it's basically a methodological tool. It's a methodological tool to learn improvisation, to learn, and, and that was rendered possible. It's a very particular moment of convergence of uh, technology and dance, mm -hmm. because this was rendered possible uh, as a historical event because of the invention of the porta pack. Yes, the, some of you might, might know that the, the, the super, that post Super 8 camera that could be uh, portable. It's the first portable camera. And that was invented in the late 60s, mm. yes? It, mm. it, it, it was only available at that moment mm. in time, yes? That's why Daniel Stern could do his work. That's also why somehow contact improvisation could be. Yeah, uh, I mean, we are cyborgs, yeah? I mean, we, uh, humans don't invent things by themselves. They, they rest on technologies to which they are uh, articulated. And this is a very good example of the cyborg age invention. Contact improvisation seems very pure, but it's not <laughs> so pure. We need, uh, there, there was the need for those images for the emergence of the form. There's a film that I cannot show for the reason, the technical reasons that I uh, explained uh, earlier, where it is called peripheral vision, where, you can, where they film themselves uh, commenting on a video and they do the <laughs> slow motion, etc. So you can find it, you cannot find it online, sadly, uh, but you can find it on the website of Contact Quarterly, which sells the DVD. It's called Peripheral Vision, and it's an hour and a half of them trying to figure out what they're doing, uh, and going backwards and saying, no, I was doing this, and no, yeah. it's quite beautiful. Can I, can I ask, <laughs> obviously this is the generation of choreographers and dancers who had a huge need to be very analytical, to analyze, to write, mm -hmm. to invent language in order to also improve, I guess, or to get to a certain, or to, to, to kind of to develop them. And uh, <coughs> obviously, Contact Quarterly started to be, start to, to be published already in the mid-70s. So. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of um, theory about why, why this generation of uh, choreographers, including Keith Paxton, had this need to analyze, because basically this is, they did it in community, which is a kind of new thing, mm -hmm. and they were very kind of literary. They basically, you could say that this is one of the examples of how kind of dance criticism or theory is coming out of the artistic have any kind of separation or is it so and perhaps then about contact quarter and how the community the history of contact disseminated or was this yeah I, well it was a joke in the 70s really when you passed the studio and you saw people sitting on the floor talking to each other oh they're doing a contact improvisation class <laughs> <laughs> because speaking was not 
available at all to dancers mm -hmm. yeah, at that time. It was like, that was not part of the practice. So as soon as you could see people speaking, that was for sure some practice. And indeed, they, the, so they are part of the generation that raised the uh, uh, verbal uh, implications of the dancer uh, to, the, to the level that were known in other arts. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, visual arts is, is a long tradition of painters, writers, mm -hmm. and that really articulate the experience, not of, uh, you know, seeing work, but of making work. Huh? The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the experience and the world that is lived from the inside of the painter is wonderfully described by Cézanne, uh, mm -hmm. by Matisse, I mean, they count it all, Bacon. Or so, what happened was, well, of course, there are the specificity of those people. Uh, Nancy Star Smith, who is again on that film, right now rolling on Lisa Nelson. Um, Nancy Star Smith studied to actually be a poet and editor. She worked with Diane de Prima, who was the only uh, female poet of the beat generation. You know, Burroughs, those people from the 60s. So she studied with her, uh, and actually the first contact totally emerged from the workshop of Diane de Prima, because Nancy was learning to be her apprentice at that time. Yes, so it really is a personal mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. uh, that makes them very connected. But Steve uh, also was a prolific writer. Like he wrote something like more than a hundred articles in total in his life. It's like the equivalent of a big of a quite sizable book. Um, and there are many uh, uh, reasons for, for this, but the main reason I feel is a, uh, a frustration felt uh, towards uh, dance criticism mm -hmm. and the way it dance was written and transmitted in the world uh, of the written material. As if uh, a feeling that um, okay, I'm going to uh, speculate, but <laughs> or to, to, to propose this. There's something in, the lang in our languages, and Steve wrote that very early. He said, I'm very uh, mad at the English language for not being able to describe movement. There's something about our languages that is very much obsessed with substantives to which, hap to which actions happen. Yes? All our uh, formations, or our grammatical formations, focus on things to which happen actions. Mm. As if movements could never be the subject yes, of the action. Yeah? As if it was, and so of course a dance critic, when, he, when they talk about dance, they, they will talk about bodies and costumes and lights, and as if they were things on stage. But there's no thing on stage. There's movement on stage to which things happen, or to which you know, events happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's this impossibility of movement, of, uh, of language to uh, name movement, or to uh, make room for the processuality, or um, the, the, the fact that we are becoming as we are right now, uh, that uh, the frustration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they started this magazine, Contact Quarterly, which has been running for 45 years, in order for dancers to be the speakers of their own experience. In order for dancers to develop their own vocabulary and lexicon to name what was happening to them. And of course it's totally imperfect and they are testing things and they did several issues that were completely uh, without words, uh, only images and montage and things like that. Uh, they. Uh, rest on philosophy, they rest on sociology, they, they try to uh, incorporate disciplines. But that really is the beginning of uh, a methodology, a new methodology in uh, even, let's say, dense writing in general, which is, let's fuck up language. Yes, let's change language. Not only, you know, employ language as it is to describe our event, which would be the, a good beginning, you know, because dance was not part of the things you would talk about anyway. The, so it's not only about talking about dance, it's about inventing a language that would fit the experience of dancing. 
And that's very much, I mean, that, that belonged, the, the rise of dance studies mm -hmm. went together with the rise of women's studies in the US. Mm -hmm. And that's not, uh, you know, uh, an accident in, 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 in academia or in the history of language. It is deeply connected to the fact that in women's studies, which were then called, which was after that called feminist studies, which was after that called queer studies, which was after that called, you know, all the names that women's studies took in the US. Uh, women's studies embraced the idea that the heteropatriarchal language was unfit to describe the experience of what it is to be gendered as a woman in this society. So the, the, this idea that uh, the struggle happens in language, the political struggle happens in language, that was very key to feminism in the 70s and 80s, I think had a replication in the dance writing. And it's not, it's not a wide speculation, it's also that dance, uh, very engaged dance writers like Jill Johnston in the US were also uh, lesbian activists, which is where feminist thought was developed, basically, in lesbian activism. So there was a lot of um, convergences between the feeling that language was conveying a certain mode of ha relating to one's body and one's experience, and the feeling that there was the elbow room, like the, some, there, were, there was room in grammar for inventing something new. And, that, and so that's what they did. They did that for 45 years. They held on to it. And it's a fascinating thing to browse. I had the chance to, uh, the privilege to be supported to do a PhD that allowed me to read all of those things. So I have, a <laughs> I, have, I have had the chance that people were to allow me to spend time doing just this. Um, and uh, it is a marvel, a marvel of inventivity uh, that uh, dancers have shown throughout the years to, well, you know, make room for the, not the inside, but the in-between mm. in the description of what happens. About, let's say, what time is it? What, I'm, just, I'm just wary of the time. Half past. Half past. Half past. something about how contact improvisation came to Europe, for example, how it, how it expanded mm -hmm. geographically, culturally, in yeah. a very... Yeah, well, the coming to Europe was quite early on mm -hmm. through the various connections that the dancers had with European minds and bodies. <laughs> uh, Simon Forti invited them in 71 in Rome and they performed uh, contact improvisation in Rome at that moment. Uh, strangely, in the first workshop of contact improvisation in Europe really happened in 78 in a music festival where John Cage was teaching also, and Steve was part of that. And that created a new uh, a genera uh, a generation of contactors in France. And the other uh, place where it emerged from was through universities, mm -hmm. Barkington College in the UK, uh, um, SNDO in Amsterdam, uh, were part of those new schools mm -hmm. that were interested in bringing the postmodern dancers, the, modern, the dancers from the 1960s, in Europe with the feeling that Europe was totally like uh, swimming in the past and needed this blood of America mm -hmm. <laughs> to feed uh, new experimentation. The Darkington connection is an interesting one because that's where Steve actually abandoned contact improvisation and started to do a new, totally different work uh, with, or not totally different, but different work with uh, people with, uh, with uh, visual impairment. So that was his transition. He left contact improvisation to work with people uh, that were See that could see for you. Okay, let's, let's yes. open the conversation. If anybody has any comments or questions or, or your or <laughs> anything to learn. I ask you a question. Mm -hmm. yes. how, how much the contact improvisation research influenced other rural dancers like mm -hmm. Julian or yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very, very hard 
that no for a reason that is um, uh, the decision that they took in 75, which is to leave the form in copyright. Yeah? Leave the form in copyright, meaning they never copyrighted it, they never patented it. You, anyone can teach contact improvisation on the first day they learned it and they say, I'm going to teach a, a contact improvisation class. Yeah, go ahead. What they did instead <laughs> of copywriting it, it was a joint decision in 75, was to create the model. Mm -hmm. They said, let's not you know, uh, lock it. Let's instead open a forum for discussion about the form. And we'll see what, you know, we'll see what happens. We will self-teach, we will co-teach each other this form. So, I'm sorry, I'm not responding to your question. <laughs> using it to talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's difficult to know because no one has to refer to movements of contact improvisation as a source for themselves. The few people who name contact improvisation as an influence, as a direct influence, would be people like DV8, people like Meg Stewart, uh, other improvisers um, like um, Keith Hennessy, um, would refer also themselves to contact improvisation. Uh, I'm thinking I'm losing a name that comes to mind immediately, but then it's okay. Um, what's interesting, I mean, the reason why it's rarely mentioned is, I, to be honest, <laughs> uh, a doubt or a sort of um, con contempt that contemporary dance has towards contact improvisation. Yeah. Like, what, a, what is this messy, sweaty, um, unclear, uh, possibly erotic practice where people are actually taking pleasure in what they are doing, which is very weird for a modern dance or contemporary dancing. Um, this has, has had implications on, well, let's say the bad reputation of the practice, which is, it's not a good thing to claim that you are uh, an heir to contact improvisation. So it's rarely mentioned as, a, as an influence, but at the same time, it is taught in many dance schools over the world and in the US in particular. So it is part of just genetic. Like it, it's now in the gene pool of what movement, what kind of movement can be done. And you know, for myself, I cannot but think that contact, of contact improvisation each time I see a woman lift a man. That I know, oh, that was introduced in the gene pool of dance by contact improvisation. Just the idea that you could reverse gender roles in that, uh, in that relation was a, a possibility that was avoided by that. So, yeah. But anyway, I think if you would study, for example, if you just looked at choreographies after Led Zeppelin, if you would see the bits with the parents, of the, if you would study duets, you would see, you would see that there is that uh, that it has to it has to be certain kind of uh, let's say some choreographers or dancers have to have certain kind of uh, mm, relation to contact mm -hmm. in their mm -hmm. curricula and it, yeah it's I think it's changed it's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 I have a question. authentic movement from Mary Whitehouse, I, I was told she invented that, with contact improvisation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I can, I, I know where they met. It's precise, I know. It, it's a city, it's called Northampton. And in that city were living three giants of uh, movement of the last 20th century, of the, yeah, late 20th century. Nancy Star Smith lived there, that's where Contact Quarterly is built. So she is quite influential in the practice. Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, who founded BMC, Body Mind Center, she lives uh, next town, in Amherst. Uh, incidentally, also lived there. Uh, shit, I forgot the name. Sorry. Lynn Margulis. Why would I forget? Lynn Margulis was the person who invented, together with James Lovelock, the Gaia hypothesis. Which allows us to understand that climate change happens. Climate change is real. Um, 
and the third person who was, the fourth person who was living there, Lynn Margulis. Read her. She's fantastic. Lynn Margulis. She's the most important biologist of the last uh, century. Really, really, really read her. Uh, Symbiotic Planet. Very good book. Um, so, and the fourth person who was living there was Janet Adler, who founded Authentication. And they were living in the same city. And of course, practices crisscrossed. Uh, and they started to articulate what they were doing together, also very clearly distinguishing. Um, authentic movement being a practice where um, the attention is brought to the witnessing, to what, what do I do when I am seeing someone doing something? What is, what is the inner operations and tracking of my mind when I am looking at you? What, why am I noticing this that I am noticing? Um, and same thing on the side of the movement. You can see already the alignment of interests. Yes, the, the fact that they were uh, both paying attention to the inner workings of consciousness as it is related to movement. They have very different goals, obviously, but that could be a shared uh, emphasis. And so that happened in the late 70s. I have a question. Yes. About the global archive, mm -hmm. I know that you are going to be the you are in the project of the creation of this quantum federation of archive. I, I read that it's going to be kind of not an archive, and uh, I didn't understand what does it mean an archive. An archive. Thank you for mentioning it. That allows me to make an advertisement. So in a year, <laughs> uh, we will air a global an archive of contact improvisation. So an archive is like archive, except there's anarchy in it. Uh, which means simply that usually an archive is constituted by a person and their interests, <laughs> as we have around us. Um, and the idea of the an archive is to propose that everyone that is involved in contact improvisation can contribute to it. Yes. So that's that at that level, it's anarchic in the sense that everyone, much like the practice itself, can be part of the making of its history. Yes of its history in the sense of historiography. So there will be a website where people can upload their interests and, uh, uh, and, and, and documents. That's a, a, a moment of where, the, where contact improvisation is looking at itself back. It's been 50 years now that this form is uh, developing. Its form of telling its history is a beautiful form. It's the magazine. The magazine is a beautiful form to tell a history because it's not a closed one. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a form that is evolved, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a retelling of the story that is actually uh, never ending, yes, uh, pointing towards the future. And it's amazing, I can tell you by reading it, how totally cyclical the questions and the, what, what people are discovering, and it, they keep repeating exactly the same thing <laughs> over and over. What if contact improvisation became performance? And what about contact improvisation in gender? And what about contact improvisation in sexuality? And what about contact improvisation in somatics? And so it goes on and on and on like this. But this is an advantage. Like we, I mean, I suffer <laughs> from the linearity of history, personally. The idea of accumulation, uh, which is very much con connected to the capitalist movement, yes, which is another name for anthropocene except that you name the enemy at the same time. Um, so it's very much connected to the capitalist scene, this idea of a history that is advancing, blah, 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 blah. The story is repeating and surfacing, and, uh, and things are evolving slowly, slowly by the fact of being repeated. And so that's what the magazine is about. The archive is, in our hope, another space for that to happen with this idea that every one of us, and right now every one of you has been you know, uh, touched in a small or big way by contact improvisation, can, for affective reasons, contribute to it and say, oh, this is what contact improvisation, what, these are the events that constitute contact improvisation for me. And probably people are, are going to put in things that have nothing objectively to do with contact improvisation. You know, they might talk about other things, like uh, that day where they saw that bird and somehow something about contact was revealed to them. It's a good
good way of making a wheel of history. Yeah? A history doesn't happen in the major. History happens in the minor of the event where something surfaces of what counts. Yes? And so, so there's going to be no moderator? Yes. And uh, but even not voting system? No voting system. Fuck the vote. Direct democracy. <laughs> no directors. <laughs> uh, I, I will not to speak about it. <laughs> that is uncomfortable. Good, like, uh, as I said in my class, awkward silences are very good. Mm. There's a lot of thought that is happening in awkward silences. So, I, yes, don't join me if I use that. <laughs> and now nobody wants to break in because it's a really awkward silence. itself is to be mm -hmm. a beginner. Mm -hmm. yeah? That I mean everyone who has spent more than you know four or five years practicing this form knows that actually what you aim at after those four or five years is to return to the beginning mm -hmm. and to that moment where you actually had no clue what you were doing mm -hmm. and that you were kind of flailing into the air and mm -hmm. not you know uh, hoping that you would survive. And you know at some point you begin to be an expert at doing it which makes you uh, very bad at doing it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, you understand that? It's yeah. like, like that's the paradox of improvisation. Mm -hmm. huh? It's hard to keep, and that's uh, one of the reasons he left so much improvisation, was that he, he, he failed at the Fulton Muse to ah, find again that specific taste mm -hmm. of not knowing. So the, the, the inability to evolve is linked very much to that uh, goal to be a beginner. And so <laughs> to be a beginner, you, you, you know, you want to stay actually in that infancy state for perpetuity. And that's a, so there's something, um, so the, the, the form will not evolve in that sense, but what it will do and what it does in that cyclical thing is to integrate the present moment from which we need to tone down. You know, what do we need to forget will change. We will always need to keep forgetting. Yes, that's the practice. The practice is to forget that we are human, gendered, uh, racialized, the, to, to forget momentarily, the, to, in order to study them again, like to understand how we are racialized, gendered, uh, uh, sexualized. But we need to keep forgetting those. We need to keep to, oh, how can I be a mass? And so these, this, the how common mechanical mass will always change because we will be different beings, social beings, always. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. It was a metaphysical answer, I'm sorry. That's training. Um,
construction. It was a uh, very good place. Talk to share and uh, come again. <laughs> yeah. Anything? Yeah, perhaps. Maybe just to invite all of you, if you don't know yet, also to the other part of the exhibition that is in the studio, Sara Letrana. Mm. Right now, for example, or like today it's really 11 o'clock. So we're perhaps you can also come up to see. Yeah, yeah, mm. you can. I mean, thanks to Manuela's wonderful work, uh, we, put, we could put this exhibition, which does a lot, but also <laughs> authorize us to invade the space. Uh, but this exhibition is also happening within a dance festival. Um, that was an important aspect of exhibiting contact improvisation, was not to have only videos, but also live practice movement. And so during the classes and during a practice that is called <coughs> jam, which is basically people not knowing how they are going to meet with each other, meeting with each other, uh, and so the evolution of that weird social encounter that happened with that words, uh, those are visible. You can just come and start on my work that way, or you can like very bad uh, <coughs> uh, and just sit in the walls, look at some archival videos, or look at the practice. So, yeah. Thank you okay. so much for uh, being here and practicing contact improvisation. Please draw on each other.